I invite us to be in an attitude of prayer to prepare ourselves for this time of the message. O oh God, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable to you, O oh God, who is our rock and our redeemer. Well, if you do follow me on social media, and a few of you are on Swarm with me, you know exactly what I've been doing this weekend. I've been going to some movies. The Oscars are coming up, and I always hate to sit there through the Oscars going, no, didn't see that one, no, didn't see that one. So I got into amazing films, two films that were just really richly done, and I think both of them were up for uh, the best picture. But more importantly, and I don't think I'm forcing them to fit into this, but they both went along with the theme that I had for this sermon today. They both have themes of persistence and surprise. Persistence and surprise. Both films were fictionalized accounts of real people and historical situations. On Friday night, I saw the imitation game at our local Capitol Theater. It's about the work of Alan Turing. How many of you all know that name, Alan Turing? Yeah, not very well known, and there's a reason why. But anyway, he was working on a team of world-class mathematicians in England with one task and one task alone. That was to crack the Nazi codes during World War II and do their best to not only end that horrific war far earlier than it would have otherwise, but almost as what seemed to be an afterthought, create the world's first computer. And both of those happened. The war ended by what they believe is maybe a year and a half to two years earlier can you imagine how many lives were saved because they figured out that code and could only do it with this brand new thing that was originally called a Turing machine? The second movie I saw was just last night, so I'm still very much trying to process it. It was about Selma. It was called, it's called Selma, and it was about the work of the civil rights leaders especially the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, working to end the entrenchment of the violent system of abuses and practices that kept African Americans from voting and therefore from having full democracy like everybody else. It's one piece of the much larger civil rights movement. And the role of persistence, patience, determination and resolve are absolutely apparent in both of these stories. In the imitation game, there was very little precedence, much less any even appreciation for the possibility that a machine of all things could sort through enormous data that was required to break codes and therefore stop the slaughter. It's hard even to remember now when the little computers or portable Turing machines that we have in our pockets are thousands of times greater in their abilities than what this group of math mathematicians worked on for years. It's hard to imagine that now. So there was a lot of impatience which required a lot of patience. Rather than sitting there working through mathematical formulas, that every night at midnight had to start over because the Germans would change the codes for the next day. They invested into this as yet untried thing called a computer. A great deal of tenacity was needed by everyone, both to trust the will wisdom of this brilliant, but as yet untested young man from Cambridge, but also to put up with his quirky behaviors and very often putting temperament. Can any of us relate to that kind of patience that you have to have with people around you? Now in Selma, the patience is known in history. 
The protagonist's skills, in this case, Martin Luther King Jr., were well known. He had already done the March on Washington's I Have a Dream speech. He had just received the Nobel Peace Prize. He was tried and true and tested, unlike Alan Turing. But you know, even then, his great skills were up against the stubbornness of racism and the doggedness of segregation that seemed to grow stronger and stronger and stronger. And what people had to have patience with was this, this way of, of working against oppression that was called nonviolence that absolutely went against the grain of so many things that our human bodies seem to go for, which is fight fire with fire, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. An enormous amount of persistence and endurance were required to not let the circumstances devolve into a bloodbath bath and fulfill the very fear that Dr. King had who would warn an eye for an eye leaves everybody blind. So that's the patience of these two stories. But what were the surprises in these stories? The surprises are actually what made these movies come to life, that made them exciting and not just a historical documentary, although those could be exciting too. The colleagues of Alan Turing were surprised by his unwavering passion. And when I mean unwavering passion, he had one thing in mind and one thing only, to make this machine work. They were surprised by his passion and his crafty management of the situation so that they wouldn't solve just one problem, although it was a huge problem that was was prayed for by every person on the planet to end this war. He knew what they were doing if they stuck with it could solve many problems, multitudes of problems. And to this day, the computer now can solve enormous problems from healthcare to finance to even being in relationship. Turing was surprised by the gradual but very real care and appreciation his colleagues developed for him, even though for his entire life before knowing them, and sad to say, his entire life after knowing him. He was labeled and treated as abnormal, unusual, and made an outcast. In Selma, and this is a little controversial, in the movie Selma, it shows the very real surprise of President Johnson at the staunch persistence and resolve of the civil rights leaders in focusing on justice at the polls as key to their liberation. It makes the case that Johnson tried to use his presidential leverage to try to convince them that other things were more important in that moment and not small things, the war on poverty. But their resolve surprised him. Every day he opened the paper to be surprised by how the civil rights leaders knew exactly what they wanted and they would not bend. But there's also some quiet personal surprises. There's a particular poignant scene in the movie, and I'm not giving anything away because this is all history. But the movie shows a young John Lewis who would later become a multi-term representative to the United States Congress. I think he is actually still serving. But this young leader is sitting talking to King and King is struggling with whether or not this is the right way to try and change the world. And Lewis replies to King with King's own words from a speech about how we cannot lose heart and grow weary in the fight for justice and equality. So all of this brings us to our scripture today. It's a parable from the Gospel of Luke. It is introduced as a story that undergirds Jesus' call to always pray and not lose heart 
It's a parable that talks about a widow. A title, a, the title alone should give away that this person is a powerless person. A widow was seen as an outcast, a lowlife, one who had no connections with anything that was important. But nonetheless, this widow petitions an unjust judge for justice in her petition. We don't know what the case is, but she petitions. And so insistently that finally she's granted her vindication. The persistence of the widow in and of itself is a bit of a surprise. Given how minuscule her authority was in the world. And it instigates a second astonishment in the positive ruling from the judge. A judge who neither feared God nor people. Respected disciples of Christ, preacher and scholar, the Reverend Fred Craddock, urges us not just to look at this parable, but it's in tandem with the parable that comes right after it. So that's what I was thinking about up there, whether or not I should go ahead and read that parable. But I think I can say it very shortly. In the second parable that he says has to go in tandem with this one, it's all about a Pharisee and a tax collector. You know the story. And the way in which they pray, the tax collector approaches God with extreme humility and even self-effacement. While the Pharisee offers prayers that are grandiose and arrogant. Craddock reminds us not to paint these two people in a quarter too quickly. They're not one-dimensional or caricatures because their culture and their context define them more than we know in this day and age. But he does say there is much to learn from this parable. The surprise that Craddock uncovers is that these two parables are both about vindication, getting what you want done, done right and done in your favor. They're about vindication. And the first one about the widow and the judge illustrates in Craddock's words, how a saint is vindicated, how someone who is good and righteous and worthy, this widow had a valid case and she won it. But he says, you don't really know what's going on until you get to the second one where the publican or the tax collector, who really, really was known to be fairly, um, let's say, uh, slimy, um, shady at least, in Craddock's words, a sinner, is nonetheless vindicated. So he makes this great parallel that in one parable, a saint is vindicated, and in the second, a sinner is vindicated, giving a little bit of hope for all of us, wherever we might fall on the spectrum. Although I know you all are more saints than anything, right? This both-and approach to God's truth is absolutely something that especially the Gospel of Luke is all about. No one should be put on a platform, but no one should be buried deep beneath the earth. One of my all-time favorite quotes that came to me while I was working on this sermon is from artist and author Marianne Bradmacher. She writes, Courage. Courage doesn't always roar at the end of the day. Courage sometimes is that little voice at the end of the day that says, tomorrow I will try again. Courage is not always a roar. Sometimes courage is a little voice at the end of the day that says, tomorrow I will try again. That's persistence. Not grand, not bold, not out of the box. It's just simple persistence at the end of the day. Personally, I understand this so passionately. Pastorally, I understand this so deeply. And what is common to both parables and to my understanding of patience is prayer. Prayer is the common denom denominator. In prayer, we must always be patient and persistent, but never presumptuous. In prayer, we must always be passionate, but never petty. 
Just as the widow pounds on the door to the unjust judge for her personal grievance, so the tax collector bows in meek humility before the divine with no thought of himself. Just as the widow seems completely oblivious to the general understanding of her place in society, the tax collector is painfully aware of what everyone thinks of him. Just as the widow receives everything that she deserves, the tax collector gives up everything he has to God. And all that happens in prayer. Patient, surprising prayer. But if I ended my sermon here, both the movie references and the parables might give you the false Conclusion that the only actor in the drama of faith that must be patient, persistent, and ready for surprises is you and me, we ourselves. And this could not be farther from the truth. I believe God, the one in whose image we are made, is also eternally patient and ever eager to be surprised and delighted by good things. So the scripture that comes to my mind that reminds me about God's patience comes from the Hebrew scriptures. The call of Samuel found in 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10. You may remember this text. In this text, Samuel is, is just a young boy and he's serving the elderly Eli, who is one of God's prophets in Israel. And in this delightful and dramatic account, on three occasions while little Samuel is sleeping, God comes to the boy quietly but persistently in a dream and calls Eli to sacred service. Call Samuel, excuse me, to sacred service. Upon hearing of this, the older man urges the boy to not discount the voice as just some kind of a fantasy or a dream, but to actually respond as if it is God. And in fact, it is. Yes, Yahweh, I am listening, the little boy says. And upon replying in this manner, God then proceeds to instruct Samuel on his mission in God's name. Thank God, God was persistent and surprised Samuel. But the ultimate story of God's surprising persistence dwells in the birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is in Jesus we see God's eternal patience with all humanity. Through all the horrors we do to one another and to ourselves, in bloody wars we fight, in ancient grievances that make their terrible presence known, in abuse and oppression, inequality and murder. And using one of the wonderful lines of my favorite hymns, I was there to hear your morning cry, when the evening gently closes in and you shut your weary eyes, I'll be there as I have always been with just one more surprise. I love that. The promise of resurrection, the gift of grace and the light of faith remains as surprising to me today as it was the first time I learned of Jesus and his embodiment of God's persistent love. Thank God, God is persistent, for then I have hope. Thank God, we are persistent, for then God has hope. So my beloved, God is a God of surprising, persistent, and persistent surprises. And as God is, so are we called also to be. Tenacious in prayer and determined in our actions to overcome evil with good. Likewise, we're invited to be prepared for surprises. For both the divine will is crafty and the human spirit is clever at its very best. And when these two things join together, who knows what kind of resurrection will be made manifest in our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen.